Bootcamp. As you have said, uh, my name is Michael Michel. I'm Enterprise Architect at Cosmos Consult, and I try to uh, give uh, the citizen developer today, after all this uh, strong technical and uh, pro developer content, a bridge to uh, start with application lifecycle management. Uh, for this, um, I am. I try to um, bring both worlds together. So I'm a pro developer and I know what is necessary to do the high tech stuff like Tom has shown. But uh, for the citizen developer, there are a couple of things we need to talk about. We need to bring them easily to the concept of LLM, to the application lifecycle management. For this, they have to understand what are environments, what are solutions, why I should use solutions to transport my canvas apps or power apps uh, canvas apps or power automate flow to the next environment where i should have a test environment and so on furthermore as a pro developer you, you know uh, we uh, know source code we love source code we love tools we love also pipelines to automate stuff and i want to give our citizen developers also a brief introduction what is possible with a fully automated application lifecycle management process. Therefore, uh, let's start over and talk about some basics of application lifecycle management. When a citizen developer starts with um, development, he creates a power app, he creates a power automated flow, he shares this flow or this app with his colleagues and collect feedback. Afterwards, he improve his app, improve his flow, modify things. But all of us knows from the pro developer side, it can be dangerous to work on a released stuff. Therefore, is a, there, there is a huge life cycle of our applications. So when we start with development as pro developers, we develop our stuff, we collect the source code, we store the source code, in a source code management system like JIT. We build some artifacts based on the source code. Our solutions, for example, we test stuff, we automate also to transport to the release to dataverse back. Collect feedback again, store the feedback in Azure DevOps Sports, for example, improve our apps and release it again. And this is a full uh, fully life cycle for application uh, for applications. To avoid uh, any trouble of breaking things, we need environments. In theory, uh, there should be a development environment, a test environment, and a production environment. It depends on the setup of the company, uh, how many environments you have. But let's keep it simple and say we have a development environment to produce stuff, to modify our apps, to program things. It's our safe environment that we cannot break anyone else. Afterwards, we take our stuff to the test environment where a couple of users test things, maybe manually, maybe automated. However, the test environment is also a safe environment where you cannot break something, but you might include production data into this environment. Finally, you ship the apps and the flows to the production environment where everyone uses it, where everyone needs to rely on this. When a citizen developer starts, he shared with one or two guys. However, if an app is uh, popular in a company, <laughs> the, the, the amount of users will grow. And then you should uh, consider about uh, such a separation in environments because of you won't break 100 users. Maybe it's, uh, it's part of their daily work, your app. Then it's uh, very critical when you break the app. And trust me, my, my, my phone ringed a couple of times when I have broken such an app in production. So therefore, separate stuff. 
to summarize, Dataverse provides us with a couple of environment types. You can use a production environment, sandbox, trail, developer, default, Dataverse for teams, and so on. For these three stages for development, just use the development environment. It's free, it's from Microsoft. You can um, Google for this, and it appears there in your database. Earth. If uh, your administrators haven't enabled uh, disabled this. For the test environment, you can use a sandbox or as well as a production environment. But keep in mind, this should be limited only for testing stuff. Finally, production environment is clear. So we have a production environment. Three environments to serve our workflow. When we look into these environments after things happen, you will see um, there are a couple of apps, flows, maybe also some dataverse customizations, tables, and so on. All the stuff is transported mostly manual by developers. I've seen previously in the chat how can we automate a transport of Power Apps manually. Um, it's, it's very cumbersome to do this. And you need also to uh, keep in mind such apps can rely on a Power Automate flow. So you need to take care about the dependencies between all of these components. In detail, when we have um, this power app and this flow, and both rely together, and you just only deploy the flow, you might break your power app in the test environment. In this case, it's not a problem because it's a test environment. You don't break a production thing. Therefore, you have a test environment. But the, the key thing is you want to transport every stuff together. For this, um, Microsoft have introduced uh, solutions. It's, um, it came original from the uh, CRM system, and now it appears also in the Power Platform in Dataverse. Solutions are there to package components. This means you can put into a solution uh, your Power Apps, your Power Automated Flows, your connectors, your cas um, all the stuff you have and you need. All what belongs together to one solution. A solution is described by a unique name, by a publisher who have published this solution, by a solution prefix to separate your components from other components with the same name. A solution have also a version. You see, the application lifecycle management concept comes more and more in place. You can version your power apps and flows together and ship it to the next level. A solution can furthermore be managed and unmanaged. And this is a little bit um, difficult. For me, uh, at the beginning, I see, I say, unmanaged is where you can modify things. You can add components, you can remove components. This means this is in development state. A managed solution is sealed. You cannot add and remove things cannot modify things on it, but you can modify still um, some components um, in the environment. However, to keep it simple, managed is for shipping things to test and to production. Unmanaged is, is for development. When a solution is installed in another uh, Dataverse environment, the included components and customizations will be applied to the target environment. That means you can install and uninstall your component. This is important. When you uninstall your component uh, solution, everything is removed from your target environment. This is a great thing. You don't leave something uh, in this uh, test environment or in a protection environment. Components of your solution may have also dependencies to other solutions or components. But this is another chapter. For a normal citizen developer, a solution is a place where I can pack everything together, where I can ship it easily to an, an, another environment. 
let's start with a small demo. I want to create a solution. I want to add a power app as well as I want to add a power automated flow. For this, I have to move into my environment, my demo environment. You see here also, I have uh, several types of environments. I have two developer environment. One is my Michael Michel developer environment. The other developer environment is for the system administrator. Furthermore, I have a production and test environment. Currently in this uh, demo environment it is trail based. So let's don't focus on this. OK, I go to my Michael Michel environment. This is my developer environment. I create a new solution. I will be asked for the name. Uh, let's say new solution. And I have to select a publisher. Previously, I've created my own publisher, Michael Michael, where my prefix came in place. When I go to edit, you can see it. Here's my display name, my 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 normal unique solution uh, publisher name, as well as the prefix where my components um, also get this uh, prefix included. Furthermore, there is a prefix of the uh, enumerations if I have um, some choices in my solution. OK, uh, let's say this new solution. Uh, what is missing? Something. Is wrong. Uh, and select the publisher again. It doesn't work anymore. So this is not so good. Why this doesn't work? I have no idea. Uh, sometimes it's a little bit. Uh, funny, but that was now. Now it works. I really for help. So the solution is created and should appear here. There it is. Now it's time for me to add some components. I can add existing components or I add a new Canvas app, for example, uh, my new app created and if it's created, if it's saved, let's add, for example, a button here. Come on and save it. Perfect. After I have saved it, it's added to my solution. This is still easy for citizen developer to repeat the steps. And this is important to include them into the fully application lifecycle management process. OK, let's move back to the solutions. Come on. Here it is. Let's give it a refresh. You see my app appears. It got my publisher prefix, then my app name, and a unique identifier, however. I can also include uh, some flows, or I can add an NASA cloud flow. Let's take this one and Add this flow. New flow, manual triggered, create, and add a scope so that the flow can be saved. Okay, perfect. Now it's saving, and finally it should be added to my solution. So it's still saving. Now it's saved. And move back, the flow appears. Every component is together in one solution. Let's move back to the. The next question how can I transport the solution from one environment to another? This means I want to export from my development environment, I want to import this to my test environment, and if the test is passed, I can import it to my production environment. This is a manual workflow. During export, I'm asked about what version do I want to have, as well as should I export my solution as managed or unmanaged solution. 
I can export my uh, solution as unmanaged solution, but I want to extract the source code and I want to store the source code. As managed solution, I can only import it to the next environment. When I have a managed solution in an environment, I cannot longer export it. What I should do is publish my Canvas app so that my changes of Canvas app are visible to the solution and to the export. Furthermore, if I have some customizations in uh, my dataverse, uh, like I've added tables, uh, forms, views, and so on, I should run the publish customizations process. There's another option, check for issues, which invokes the solution checker and which gives me some hints what I can improve or should improve of my apps and flows. On the other side, for the solution import, the first uh, import is still import stuff because the solution does not exist there. After this first import, I am asked about should I upgrade my solution or should I update the solution? The difference is upgrade or stage for upgrade, which means run the upgrade later, merges the previously installed solution with the new version of the solution. In this case, components which are not longer part of the newer solution are removed from my environment. On the other hand, the update replaces my old solution. In this case, components which are not longer part of the newer version of my uh, solution still exist in this environment. They will be moved to the unmanaged default solution of this environment. This means in this case, I mess up my environment. The recommended way is to upgrade a solution in this case. Let's run this um, as a manual workflow. So I export the solution from development environment and I will import the solution into test and into prod. Okay. Let's go back to the solutions. I can export here the solution. You see these two options. I can run the customize, uh, publish the customizations as well as run the solution checker. This will take a couple of times, uh, a couple of minutes. Therefore, I will skip it. Afterwards, I'm asked about what version do I want to publish or export. So it increases automatically the version here. I can export it as an unmanaged solution package or as an uh, as a managed solution package or as an unmanaged solution package. If I want to use the solution for test, I should use managed. Otherwise, if I want to extract the code, I can use unmanaged. And this starts the process. This takes a while. Therefore, I move over to my test environment. And previously, I have prepared another solution it called my solution. I use it here. And you see, for the first import, it only loads the solution, but it does not ask me about um, should I upgrade or update. I can run the import, and this takes also a couple of minutes. In my production environment, you see I have my solution previously installed. Here is the version 1.001. And for this, I select a newer version. It's the version 1.002. And here I will be asked, uh, it's already exists, uh, damn, maybe it's this wasn't expected by me. Maybe I've imported the newer version before. Oh, come on. No, this doesn't work. Let's import the newer version here. Maybe this works. No, this also works. Also not. Ah, it's demo time. Uh, let's export this again. As managed package. Maybe I have 
done a mistake. And hopefully this takes not so long so that I can show you the dialogue or you have to trust me. <laughs> Otherwise. Oh, come on, solution export, please, please hurry up. I guess this takes a couple of seconds, so let's continue. This is you have to trust me that uh, I'm asked about upgrade or update. However, let's move on and take a look at the pro developer side. We want to have the source code of the solution and of the Canvas apps. And we want to store the source code inside of a JIT repository. For this, we can do everything manually. Later, we can do it also automatically. Let's look what we have to do. We have seen when I export a solution, it's just a zip file. When I look into the solution itself or extract it with zip, I get files. The better way is to uh, use the solution packer. It makes the uh, correct folder structure for me. As well as I can also use the solution packer to pack finally the sources back to the solution zip file. When we look to the files, uh, there is a solution manifest. Uh, there are uh, is an XML which includes all the customizations I have to the environment, and I have my components like my Canvas apps, my workflows, and so on. When we look a little bit deeper, and we see here we have the MS app files. This is also just a zip file. You can rename it, can look into this uh, file, and you will see a lot of JSON files. This means our MS app file contains the information of our Canvas app. Here we have our resources, our references, our controls as JSON. This would be okay to store this as a JIT repository because it's source code, but there is a better way. Microsoft have um, Later last year, uh, introduced the Power Apps language tooling. This means this is a way to extract the source code of an MS app file of a Canvas app into a developer friendly source code. Here on the right side, you see a, sc a screen which is written in YAML, yet another markup language format. And you see the screen have a button added, like I did previously in my demo. You see, furthermore, there are the sources. You have the app YAML file, you have the uh, themes JSON, and a couple of other, other information. This is useful to store it because with a JIT repository, you can see differences between one version and another version. When we look to the full process, so we use our unmanaged solution, we download it, we export it to a zip file, we extract the zip file, and we store the zip content or the source code inside of the repository. In detail, we unpack the solution, and we have to unpack each of the Canvas apps included in one solution. Furthermore, uh, we have to do some uh, post-processing because of some of the included JSON files are only minimized JSON content. And this is not so uh, nice uh, to, to see the difference between one version and another version. Therefore, we uh, do a little bit pretty print over these files to get a um, more developer-friendly difference when we look at uh, two different versions of this committed app at the uh, JIT repository. Okay, when we have all the sources included in a JIT repository, to automate things, we need to reproduce the full process in the opposite way. In this case, we have to take our JIT repository, our source code, we have to pack everything 
to a solution zip file and this solution zip, zip file should be a managed solution to import this managed solution into any of our dataverse environments. In this case, we have to clone, update our local repository. We have to do some pre-processing of some files, which means I want to set their version number as well as I will change the manage flag to get a managed solution from the source code. Afterwards, I have to pack all my Canvas apps, which was previously unpacked and stored as source code. And I have to pack finally the solution to a solution zip file. Afterwards, I can import all the stuff. To summarize this content, the solution zip file contains all information about my components. I have manifest, which describes the solution, where also the solution publisher is included and so on, as well as it contains the customizations to the target dataverse environment. Solutions components can be power automated flows, power apps, which means canvas apps, model driven apps, custom connectors, uh, everything what is possible. Finally, we have also the uh, Canvas apps. They are stored as MS app files inside of a solution. We can use the Power Apps language tooling to extract a developer-friendly source code from this app file. Inside of this Canvas apps are every is everything included what is what belongs to the canvas app like references controls and so on still this is a manual pro developer workflow but the good news is microsoft have introduced uh, a new command line interface it called power platform cli my, one of my favorite tools to be honest because of this do everything in one tool you can download this tool here at uh, AKMS Power Platform CLI. When you have installed it, it uh, provides you uh, some helpful commands like PAC admin and OS to uh, work with your database environments. This means you can introduce your database environments to the Power Platform CLI, where you can use the PAC solution command to export and import solutions or pack and unpack solutions. Another good thing, they have also included right now the uh, Canvas app command. This means you can also pack and unpack Canvas apps with this Power Platform CLI. When I work as a pro developer, I do this normally in uh, VS Code. For this, uh, Microsoft have added an uh, extension which installs automatically in VS Code the Power Platform CLI or on your local computer. And this extension uh, keeps also your Power Platform CLI on the newest uh, version. We have seen previously there are a lot of manual workflows you have to. Uh, export and unpack solution and to pack and import solution. And uh, for this, uh, I was a little bit a lazy developer, so I provide a build it my own extension. It's also uh, free and available on GitHub to optimize this workflow. But let's start on Power Platform CLI and I will show you how to unpack your solution, unpack the Canvas apps to pack Canvas apps and to pack a solution. Let's move to the command line. I have previously installed my Power Platform CLI. You see all these fancy commands. And when I say Power Platform CLI, OS, list, you see also my different environments. I have here currently selected my Dataverse environment, the development environment with the right URLs and the account. So uh, let's look to my directory and you see I have uh, downloaded here also 
previously in the solution it called tools. Let's move a little bit. This is the command to unpack a solution. PAC solution unpack minus my zip file. I can say which archive do I want to unpack and to which folder. I run this and it extracts all the components of my zip file in the right way. So let's open the folder and we see here everything is extracted. We have here our solution manifest with my version and with the information if this package is managed or unmanaged. Zero is unmanaged, one is managed. It's pretty easy. Here are also the customizations you see, entities, workflows, and so on. What belongs to the solution? And you see also the binary content, the MS app file, as well as the image related to the MS app file. However, let's extract the Canvas app. For this, let's use the PAC Canvas unpacked unpack minus minus app, the correct um, file name and the target. Where I recommend to use the name of the app, but uh, replace the uh, dot with an underscore and also extend this name with an underscore sources. Now the source code is extracted and let's look to my VS code. You see, here is the extracted source code of my Canvas app and you will see also the screen with the meaningful content of this Canvas app. The opposite way is PIC pack. You see canvas pack command. Let's run this. It includes everything, creates the app file from this. And finally, uh, we can use also the solution uh, pack command from the sources. But first of all, I need to specify here also the uh, minus minus information and I need to change here in the solution manifest uh, where it is. The managed flag, otherwise I get an error and what I should do also, I need to remove the extracted folder. And let's call it managed. Oh, I have a mistake. Unknown part minus minus managed uh, package type. Eh. Managed. Now the solution is packed on the correct solution file. What I can do now is a PAC solution. And you see, I have here also the import and export command and can exp import this solution into a target environment. Okay. Let's move over to VS Code, to an empty directory, and to my own optimized uh, part of this uh, extensions. Uh, when I go here to my environment, I see all these solutions, I can select the solution and I can say download and unpack the solution. I will be asked if I want to publish all customizations. I will skip it for now. Let's download it. And after a couple of seconds, the solution is downloaded as well as all included Canvas apps are extracted. So you see, here's my Canvas app and I have the source code here just an optimized workflow for me to collect my source code from an environment, store it in JIT repository, and finally uh, do the way in the opposite way, where I can say pack solution, 
I can specify, uh, let's use this environment, say, yeah, it's here, my tools solution. And it asked me how I should import the solution as managed or unmanaged. And which version do I want to import? This runs now in the background, also a while afterwards it is imported. Let's move on with the slides. Where are my slides? There it is. Okay. To wrap up, the Power Platform CLI is a beautiful tool which helps you to export and import solutions by using a command line. It's still a manual pro developer workflow, but you can automate things. You can also pack and unpack solutions. And much better, you can pack and unpack the included Canvas apps. Therefore, you get all source code from your solution. You can store the source code in your JIT repository and generate a solution file from the stored source code. The next thing is uh, you can use VS Code. There are two um, extension which help you to uh, support your manual workflow and make it a little bit faster by just clicking in command. And now we come to the high tech topic. Um, previously, the speakers have um, introduced also some pipelines. So I will uh, focus right now a little bit uh, lesser to this topic because it might be boring for all citizen developers. But the basic knowledge is there are three kinds of types of pipelines. You can use an export pipelines where you do all those manual tasks with pro developer automated. This means the pipeline initializes a JIT repository. It might check out the JIT repository. It creates a branch on the repository. It publishes the customizations at Dataverse. It runs the solution checker at export the solution, it unpacks the solution, it unpacks all Canvas apps, as well as it takes the source code, commits the source code and push it to the repository. That is, that the source code is stored finally at Azure DevOps or at GitHub. There are a couple of um, approaches for this. You can use classic pipelines, you see it on the right side, or you can use um, YAML pipelines um, provided um, yeah, in other tools, or you can write it by your own by using PowerShell scripts or the PAC commands. Second pipeline is the build pipeline, where you generate an artifact from the source code. This means you check out the repository, you set the version based on the build number, you set the managed or unmanaged flag, you pack all Canvas apps, you pack the solution, you store the solution zip file as an arbit effect at Azure DevOps or anywhere else. You can repeat the same process also to get the unmanaged solution to store both artifacts at your at Azure DevOps or at GitHub. Then is the release uh, is the import pipeline. It takes an artifact and it imports this artifact to a specified database instance. A release pipeline can import all the stuff first at test environment, afterwards at the production environment, if everyone agrees and say, yes, this the manual test is passed, the solution is correct, it serves my needs as a tester. For this, uh, this pipeline download the artifact, it imports the solution either by run an upgrade, run a staged upgrade, or run an update. It depends on how you set up the things. It updates the component ownership because it does everything as a service account. No user interaction. It does in the background. And finally, it updates also the connection settings to your connections in the target environment. 
What I recommend also when you use artifacts at Dash site, just promote those artifacts to make it visible so the artifact is imported into a target environment. To summarize this, we have three pipelines, one to export a solution, one to build a solution, one to import a solution. The export stores the source code at the Git repository. The build solution creates an artifact to store it, for example, in Azure DevOps, and the import solution takes the artifact import our solution into test environment and production environment. This is possible without any user interaction. This means three pipelines, three automated jobs, which run in the background. Artifacts can be managed the managed uh, solution as well as the unmanaged solution. Depends on your full application lifecycle management process. And now the, the best thing. Microsoft have provided uh, an, uh, a new tool that called Application Lifecycle Management Accelerator. This is included in the Center of Excellence. The Center of Excellence starter kit itself is open source. It's available on GitHub, and it has um, a lot of solutions. All the solutions are based on best practices, mostly for enterprise customers. The cool thing is, furthermore, <laughs> there is a monthly update of such components. The draw point, you have to use it by your own risk and you have to do everything manual to import the solutions to implement the process in your company. However, it is a very good starting point because you have enterprise grade ALM workflow. You find the uh, so we starter kit either at AKMS slash so we starter kit or at GitHub where you can also provide some issues and feedback to Microsoft. When we look at the Power Platform ALM Accelerator, then you see, well, it gives you a Power App. And this is the point where the citizen developer is able to trigger our process. So this, think about when a citizen developer have understood to collect his components in a solution, we can use this tool to transport this, this uh, solutions between the environments. This is just an abstraction of the complex pro developer workflow to the citizen developer. So the citizen developer can come here and say, okay, I have done some changes in my solution, just commit the solution and deploy the solution, which means in the background, create a pull request. Furthermore, it can say, okay, we have a, a, a solution stored in our JIT repository, and I want to deploy the solution to my target environment, to validation or to test or to production. So it triggers a manual workflow uh, it triggers automated workflow by using a power app. Look a little bit to the installed part. So you see, here's the ALM accelerator inside of my demo environment. When I select the environment, I see all my solutions. I have previously uh, created two one. And I can say, okay, uh, I want to commit the solution. This means all the changes will be stored inside of a JIT repository. As a pro developer, I can do an advanced view. So I can create branches and so on. I can create a new branch with a branch name, or I use this branch. I can also uh, prepare with a second, I need to enter a release notes. This uh, process by checking some connections or references in the target environment. This is a very nice thing where it analyzes analyze my solution dependencies to an environment. 
you can see, I can select here one of my target environments. Uh, unfortunately, I have nothing inside of my Power App, and it says also, okay, to who want I want to share my Power Apps, as well as uh, the component overshare. Nothing to do here right now, just save it and commit the solution. Finally, the things the thing kicks off an Azure pipeline and the Azure pipelines come out of this box from Microsoft. They are based on a template repository. The only thing what you have to do is to set up the whole environment in your Dataverse environment. This is pretty great. And after a while, the whole job starts and does all the magic what the pro developer knows, but it's served to a citizen developer. And also uh, very nice thing is you can look at the history. What happened all to your application, to your solution, when it was deployed, when it was uh, committed and so on. You see, I've tested a little bit <laughs> to keep this running. However, this is a very nice tool and makes the life much more easier. The tech details in the background, there's a template repository of pipelines provided by Microsoft. They are installed into your Azure DevOps environment. And uh, the current preview is all based on Azure DevOps. There's a second preview uh, or there was a second preview in the main file, it was based on GitHub and GitHub Actions. However, I prefer Azure DevOps, so the newest preview is on this um, technology, which makes my life much easier. The workflows, when you commit is a, a solution, you export it and you store it at the JIT repository at the branch. Deploy, the deploy solution, creates a pull request from your branch into the main branch, import solution, so you select the target environment and you can install the solution into a target environment. And uh, finally, uh, well, you can also delete a, a solution from an environment. Under the bottom line, this is a maker friendly user interface and indeed it includes the citizen developer in this process. Another thing is, it is based on enterprise grade ALM processes. So the best thing of both worlds. Summarizing, I guess in my presentation, I, I hope I have uh, explained for both for citizen developer as well as for pro developer, the basics of ALM. As pro developer, we need to include our citizen developer in those concepts and we need to ensure what is an environment, well, which environment, environments do we need, as well as how we can include components into a solution to transport this solution from one environment to another environment. This is basic knowledge and every citizen developer should know about these possibilities. It makes the life so much easier. The second thing is, I have shown you how to transport such a solution from one environment to another environment. Furthermore, I have shown you how to get the source code from the, in, uh, from the solution, which makes us able to store the source code at the JIT repository. Furthermore, I have shown you some tools like the Power Platform CLI or VS Code extension, which makes life much easier. This means we can optimize a manual pro developer workflow, export the source code, store the source code, generate a solution from source code and import it to an environment. Finally, there are enterprise grade LMM and processes. You can also set up your own repository or your own pipelines in your own Azure DevOps or GitHub and uh, script everything uh, to your own needs. 
or you can use the Microsoft ALM accelerator as a good starting point. It's up to you what you prefer. So for me, it's why not? Let's start with ALM as early as possible. We can do much more with a uh, with a with a proper process. Yeah, thanks for listening, and I hope you enjoyed my presentation. Let's look at chat. So. Yeah, things happen from time to time. <laughs> my solution is to reload the page. This is right. Unfortunately, this happens a lot in Power Platform. During the import of a solution, in what scenario do we need to use update as opposed to upgrade? Um, Microsoft have also chosen the update scenario in one case uh, of the SOE starter cap because of the upgrade didn't work. Um, I would prefer to use as long as it makes sense the upgrade process because it's much cleaner. And um, I guess the update process, uh, uh, the update, you can use it uh, if everything else doesn't work in your target environment. However, the update is faster, it's clear, you replace the solution. Upgrade merges the solution and each component itself. And um, it makes sense to use it for larger components. So the next thing uh, we use code extension to do you install? To have this available. Um, I have installed the Power Platform tools from Microsoft as well as the Power Apps Helper. Both extensions um, do all the stuff what I have shown. The Power Platform tools brings the Power Platform CLI in the background so you don't have to install it manually. The Power Platform uh, Power Apps Helper, I need to change the name in the future. <laughs> brings uh, the access to the database environment. Underneath, the Power Apps Helper uses the Azure Login me mechanism to authenticate at, Azure uh, at your tenant. But however, you can also authenticate an, on a different tenant, which makes sense because mostly you deploy also stuff to a customer tenant. Oh, I've seen, uh, I think I have added the correct link. Great demo and explained so far. Thanks, Markus. Yes, there's also support for environment variables. Um, you can um, add environment variables into a solution. Um, Mostly, I um, prefer to uh, use an environment variable, for example, to specify also which Power App version I deploy, because the normal version of the Power App isn't visible. So during my build process, I in increase this environment variable and it, it is installed into the uh, target environment. So I can see inside of my Power App very easily which version, version do I have deployed. But I guess uh, currently uh, there is um, a new way to use environment variables together with the Azure Key Vault of envir en environment. You should uh, think about this option. Um, you find uh, 
samples of these um, pipelines right at the Microsoft page, as well as uh, I will also provide some examples in uh, a future blog post on my own page where you can uh, look into the process. But I still recommend to use the pipeline templates and the pipelines from the LM, uh, ALM accelerator because they include everything. And uh, this is very, uh, very good. As a company which do not have citizen developer only pro developer, do you suggest to use LMS, LM accelerator or to build own DevOps pipelines? Um, at Cosmo Consult, um, I have created some own DevOps pipelines based on our needs, but these uh, pipelines are originally based on the uh, task and on the content of the uh, of the LM accelerator. So I use mostly 90% of the LMS accelerator pipelines, but I have included some own tasks to serve our needs. But I update um, frequently the templates from the Microsoft side. Uh, well, uh, the LM accelerator needs premium license because of um, in the background it uses database tables as well as it kick off uh, the uh, pipelines uh, by using a custom connector. Unfortunately, this is the part where Microsoft tried to sell premium licenses. Could you do updates of minor releases and then do an upgrade of minor major releases? Uh, to be honest, I didn't have tried this. I'm not sure. I can't answer this question. Currently, I roll out my own power apps by using um, these pipelines, and um, they, are, they are clean forward updates or upgrades of the solution which is deployed, which makes sense for me to keep it a uh, minimum complex. In my ex uh, experience on the uh, so we starter kit solutions. Um, they are very complex and they are worse to look at because of uh, they have some interesting um, um, development content there. So they use flows to kick off other flows and to automate things. From development perspective, they are very interesting. As well as if you uh, implement the Zoe starter kit, you make things visible to the company and to others. So it helps a lot to uh, introduce governance and all this uh, stuff. Furthermore, you have also some um, apps to uh, request new environments for development or for deployment of apps. Do you delete with upgrades? Sorry, that was me. I um, I, I right. typed one message and then followed up on another one, and someone got in between. Sorry about that, Michael. I'm just confusing you. So ignore yeah. me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so yeah, thanks for all. I hope you have enjoyed my session, and so only two minutes left. I guess I hand over to the next presenter. Thank you for listening.
Thank you, Michael. Um, hello, everyone. I'm David. I think at this point I'll be taking over from Whale, who's done an excellent job as host. So first of all, thank you very much, Whale, for facilitating and hosting and doing all the intros and stuff like that um, and keeping us all on track. Um, and yes, on to the next session. It's an absolute pleasure and delight to announce Joe Griffin about to talk. We've actually uh, met a couple of times and I've seen him. you do a lot of content on LinkedIn and stuff like that. You're, um, you, you, you share a lot of knowledge um, in the community. So it's an absolute pleasure to have you here. Um, you're also a director. So, um, and today you'll be talking about to flow or not to flow, LM considerations and approaches for Power Automate and Azure Logic Apps. Please kick off, Joe. Thank you very much. Wow, what an introduction. Thank you, David. <laughs> okay, no great. Yeah, so really pleased to be with you here today. Um, so before we kick off, just um, a, a big thank you to the sponsors for today's event, which we can see on the slide down here. We thank them for obviously supporting this event. Um, without their support, we couldn't be here today sort of presenting. So do please check out uh, what they're offering, what they're all about, um, you know, as a way of sort of uh, thanking them for uh, their support today. So we're going to move on and let me just go on to the next slide. Uh, so yeah, so as David has said already, uh, today we're going to be talking about Power Automate and Logic Apps, and we're going to be hopefully trying to answer the question, do we want to flow or not to flow when it comes to using one or the other tools, uh, particularly when we are um, looking to, you know, adopt a really sort of healthy automated ALM process, um, you know, with our particular Power Platform solution. So just kick off with just a few details about myself. Um, we'll also just cover off, okay, well, what, you know, what, what are we actually talking about today? It may be that you've never heard of Logic Apps before. It may be just not too sure in terms of what we mean by Cloudflow. So we'll cover that off first of all. We'll also talk about, okay, what do we actually mean by ALM? You know, what are we trying to sort of achieve with that? And then we'll jump in and look at what I've termed the sort of the good, the bad, the ugly when it comes to our Cloudflows and our Logic Apps. We'll have a demonstration uh, to hopefully show some things off with there. Uh, and then we'll close off and have hopefully have some time for a bit of a Q&A um, session towards the end. Um, but please, as the session is going through, uh, I've got the two screens open on here. So please do ask your questions in the chat uh, and I'll try and just sort of, um, you know, get things answered as we go along. Uh, Want to have a good, healthy discussion today if we can. So yeah, David's already touched on this a little bit already, but yeah, my, hi, my name is uh, Joe Griffin. I am Managing Director of Solar Cloud Solutions, a Microsoft Gold partner uh, based in the sort of northwest of the UK. Um, so I spend a lot of my time sort of um, consulting and advising technically uh, when it comes to um, the sort of the core business applications uh, lineup uh, with a particular focus towards uh, Power Platform, the customer engagement applications, and also Microsoft uh, Azure as well. Uh, I'm involved as part of different events and also as part of the uh, Manchester user group um, um, which, where we're hoping to have our next in-person event uh, very, very soon. So please keep an eye out for that. Um, so, yeah, as I say, I work very technically when it comes to the platform. Um, so experience working with C Sharp, .NET, SQL Server. And in terms of the customers and clients that we're working with at the moment at Solo, it's everything from uh, companies with, you know, two to three employees uh, right through to sort of global organizations. And again, really just advise and consulting about how we can best leverage these uh, technologies uh, and really providing that sort of uh, technical uh, consultancy and expertise uh, where relevant. Okay, so what? So let's first of all talk about what we uh, um, are going to be looking at today and look at Cloudflows first of all. So hopefully you know what these are already, but if not, then these are our primary uh, sort of automation tools that we can leverage within the Power Platform. Uh, so, we, so whether we're looking to do sort of, you know, personal productivity sort of automations, you know, maybe do something like, uh, you know, go through our email inbox, download all attachments, then save them onto OneDrive, or if we're looking to, you know, implement more advanced automation scenarios uh, where we're trying to sort of get our different systems integrated together. So whenever maybe a new Dataverse row is created, we want to go off into our SQL database or into maybe our Salesforce system and do something. Power to make can support all of these different scenarios sort of end to end. Uh, you know, and we've also got lots of nice things out of the box that we can leverage, which we'll uh, touch upon in a bit more detail in a few moments, things like the approval engine. Uh, and we've got nice support for being able to leverage our cloud flows, regardless of where our sort of technical stack exists. So if we're on the cloud, great, we can work with our cloud systems, our cloud uh, SaaS products, or if we're still on premise, uh, we can very quickly and easily connect up to uh, those environments using the on-premise uh, data gateway. Now, Logic Apps, uh, by comparison, are very similar, and we're going to touch upon that in, uh, on why that is in a few moments. 
And what we've got here is a more sort of uh, advanced uh, sort of, I guess, enterprise automation solution that we can turn to. Uh, so really, it will achieve the same sort of, um, and we can achieve the same sort of aims with our logic apps compared to our cloud flows. Um, logic apps go a little bit further by having support for more advanced features. So, for example, if maybe, for example, if we are um, looking to migrate away from uh, BizTalk, uh, we've got a range of different APIs that are available in logic apps that can help ease our migration, um, you know, towards the cloud, cloud uh, a bit more easily. And the main benefit that our logic apps gives us compared to our cloud flows is that we can we can get in to the actual underlying code, you know, and fiddle away with it to our heart's heart's content. Um, with our cloud flows, we're really um, encouraged to use that sort of designer process, you know, which is great for our citizen developers, great for those who are maybe not too familiar with working with code. They can go in and build out their flows very easily. But if we wanted to maybe do some slightly more complex things, slightly more, um, you know, interesting things when it comes to maybe parameterization and things like that, with Logic Apps, we've got the ability to be able to do that. We can go in at any time. We can see we've got the option there, code view, go in, make some amends, and those will then be reflected as part of our uh, solution. So this slide here gives us a, a bit of a summary in terms of what the key differences are. So Power Automate is a software as a service product. As part of that, we are typically maybe uh, consuming that as part of a license. It could be that maybe we have got a Dynamics 365 customer engagement license that includes uses rights for that. It could be that we've purchased um, you know, uh, a license that gives us 10,000 runs per month or something like that. Uh, various different ways in which we can sort of consume that with the expectation that we've got predictable cost around that. Logic apps, uh, by comparison, are more of a sort of a platform as a service type offering. And here we're being paid based on usage. So the more we use, the more we're going to pay potentially. Um, so potentially quite nice if we've got low um, usage scenarios. And in fact, we get a dedicated amount of credits included or runs included per month for our logic apps, um, potentially meaning that we can run it for free. But as we start to get in, look into those heavy duty scenarios, it's going to cost us quite a bit more. As we touched upon already, we can get a bit more hands on with the code with our logic apps and we can use tools such as Visual Studio or the online designer to build and write those. So if we're coming from more of a pro developer background, then it might be we're going to have a, ni a nicer time with our logic apps. Um, one important difference between our Power Automate and logic apps is that uh, when it comes to Dataverse, uh, we've got this concept of the current environment connector in Power Automate, which as the name implies, uh, will always ensure that we are connecting to the correct Dataverse environment based on where our flow resides. So if we're in our production environment, our flow is going to look at production. If we're in test, it's going to look at test, et cetera, et cetera. Logic Apps by comparison doesn't have this concept of the current environment connector. Indeed, at the moment, the only connector that you've got on there is the one that is actually marked as a legacy at the moment. Um, so what developers must do as part of that is, you know, state very clearly, OK, this is the Dataverse environment that we want to connect to. It's not going to be able to go in and, um, you know, uh, understand what environments we've got or indeed align to a current environment because, you know, from an Azure standpoint, we don't have the concept of environments there. We've got concepts of resource groups and things like that instead. Uh, as I touched upon a few moments ago, Power Automate gives us this nice, really nice uh, approval automation engine that we can use sort of out of the box. Uh, so if we're wanting to implement very simple or complex approval scenarios, we can do that very easily in Power Automate. Uh, these capabilities are not available in Logic Apps and we would have to build them out bespoke. We've already talked about the ways in which we can charge um, for our different uh, Power Automate and Logic Apps. And Power Automate has the concept of connection references and environment variables, which is something that we're going to return to uh, in a short while. Whereas our Logic Apps instead um, maybe are a bit better in the sense that we've got more richer parameterization capabilities. And as part of that, we will typically use either an Azure uh, RM resource manager templates, or if we are um, uh, hoping looking to work on the more sort of bleeding edge of Azure, we maybe look to create a bicep template instead. So if I explain some of the key differences between both of these tools. So when it comes to um, what, well, and as you may have seen in the screenshots, well, hang on, these tools look fairly similar. You know, is there actually much difference with them? Well, actually, you know, our Power Automate uh, cloud flows are effectively just logic apps behind the scenes. Whenever we create a new cloud flow, it's going off behind the scenes um, and creating a logic app. The key difference with that is that we're not getting the full experience exposed out to us. Um, but the benefit of that is that when we're maybe looking at um, scenarios where we're wanting to, um, 
use maybe cloud flows and logic apps sort of interchangeably we can be assured that we've got the same set of connectors for the most part uh, the same offering experience we can go into the portal and use this designer and both of these will also support the the on-premise gateway that i spoke about a few moments ago now same connectors um as we touched upon already so um the current environment connector for dataverse isn't available for logic apps Likewise, there are some more sort of advanced uh, connector types that aren't available in Power Automate that does to do things like XML, JSON, validation and parsing and things like that. Um, if we wanted to leverage those, we need to go off into our logic apps. At any time, if we wanted to, we can look to, I guess, promote our cloud flows into a logic app. Um, we've got the ability of being able to export the, um, the underlying template for our flow into a logic app template that we can then um, import into Azure and then set up accordingly. The key caveat with that is that we just need to make sure that we're using a supported set of connectors. So if we were to, for example, try and export a flow that's using the Dataverse current environment connector, uh, then we're gonna find that we're not gonna be able to do that. Uh, and we can also work interchangeably. So maybe we could have a cloud flow that calls a logic app, uh, a, a, power app, a power app that calls a logic app, or even vice versa as well. So we've got some, um, potentially fun scenarios that we could look to set up and you know potentially a Cloudflow and a logic app could be um, good bedfellows depending on the type of scenario that we're working with so it raises a bit of a natural question at this point okay well which tool should we be using then if, if they are broadly the same then which is going to be best for a particular scenario so here's what i think is what you would see the term as maybe the official guidance what microsoft would advise you um, so for cloud flows, you know, definitely if you're in a situation where you've got citizen developers in your organizations, where you've got those very sort of simple or maybe semi-complex integrations that you look that you want in, and where you're working very closely with Microsoft Dataverse and need to be able to sort of um, benefit from the current environment connector, then these will be our sort of good scenarios where we can use our cloud flows. And we can very easily and quickly uh, get these into the hands of our citizen developers or our functional consultants, and they can set these up um, you know, with minimal barriers in our particular environments. Logic apps is, will be more for those situations where we're wanting to do a bit of sort of pro code or maybe fusion extensibility. Uh, you know, maybe we're in situations where we've got uh, workflows that are executing quite sort of um, rapidly, uh, where we need to leverage those more advanced connector options that we spoke about. Um, there will also be situations where maybe we need to have better control and better monitoring of our particular um, automation. So if we need to be able to have access to logs going back over 30 days, or if we need to export out um, logs from our cloud flows into something like Azure Monitor or something like that, then, then at the moment, Logic Apps is going to be the only option that we can consider there. So hopefully that helps, helps sort of um, set in your mind, okay, well, what should we be recommending? What should we be going down based on the scenario that we're looking at? So that gets us half the way, but you know, and, and and in theory, it all sounds good, but we have got a bit of an issue here, and I'm interested to hear what other people's thoughts are in the chat about this. Uh, if you have got experience with this, the key issue seems to be that when we're looking to do that full nice automation using Azure DevOps, we're trying to get our cloud flows deployed out, you know, into multiple environments. It's not really a great experience. There tends to be a case that we can't just get it working or even if we find a way to get it working it typically involves us having to write a lot of different sort of custom scripts um, you know a lot of uh, manual intervention is required as part of that and it's not going to be as nice to deploy a cloud flow out uh, compared to a logic app and this is the argument that um, I'm potentially going to be making to you today and again I'm really interested to hear in the chat what your own thoughts are on this and whether you agree or disagree it could be maybe I'm just a big dummy um, you know I've been banging my head against this for, for, for too long uh, and I'm missing something obvious uh, but certainly this is the feeling that I get today when it comes to our cloud flows so you know what we're trying to do with our ALM you know or our application lifecycle management process ultimately is achieve these key aims that we can see on the slide here we want to ensure that we've got really sort of nice consistent deployments that we can repeat uh, we can give the business the assurance that you know when we do a deployment into sort of production it's going to stick first time we're not going to be having to go in after the fact fix a load of issues not going to have a load of different errors and stuff like that uh, and really it starts to get us you know feet, uh, our particular sort of power platform solution feeling very sort of mature and with that maturity, we can manage it a lot better. 
Now, this is not necessarily going to be a one size fits all approach, you know, so typically maybe investing heavily, uh, particularly when it comes to automated application lifecycle management for a smaller organization, it, it might not be um, you know, the best fit. And over time, things can get particularly sort of complex. But what I would say with that is, uh, you know, don't forget the, the old acronym KISS, uh, keep it simple, stupid, uh, you know, ALM, you know, if you're doing it right, it should be achieving, you know, a very specific purpose uh, and you should be trying to reduce complexity where, where possible. And that's going to help us hopefully to assure that our deployments will always complete and we'll have that, um, um, you know, that, that, that sort of bulletproof sort of assurance each time. So a lot of the theory when it comes to ALM and in particular ALM with DevOps and the Power Platform, you know, this is this is what um, you know we talk about, what Microsoft talk about wanting to provide to um, you know to you know our Power Platform sort of solutions and deployments. Um, we, it, the aim is to we want to try and ensure that we that we are able to get started very quickly. You know, so it's not going to take us you know a day and an age to set up a new environment. It's not going to be a massive issue to get integrated alongside DevOps or our source control systems, it should be an easy process. Um, when it comes to our builds, when it comes to the tooling around that, we should be able to embrace this very, very easily. It's going to be quick and easy for us to create, for example, a build pipeline in DevOps, use a couple of different action steps, and then from there we can, we've got our full deployment process mapped out. Uh, as part of that, we want to ensure that we've got this repeatable and predictable, predictable deployment methodology. You know, it should be getting to a point where at any point we can just reset, for example, our development environments, we can run a DevOps pipeline and everything should be restored to how we need it to be. And that's what it, it should be as easy as that. Uh, and, and around that, when it comes to, um, you know, the manage, management capabilities around, for example, our environments, all of that should be a really nice experience. You know, so for example, we should be able to easily create a new Dataverse environment, we should be able to back that up easily. We should be able to reset it if we needed to. All of this shouldn't be a massive hassle to set up. And finally, um, you know, at the back end of this, what we should, what we expect, or what we, what we hope to get to is that there'll be this really consistent and valuable telemetry that we can access, you know, across all of our different deployments, all of our different environments. So again, we can start to sort of close that feedback loop and we can start to really understand the health of our particular solution deployments and ensure that we are, um, you know, taking proactive action where necessary to resolve or fix any problems or issues. And all of this, um, in, as, as the theory states, is powered by the set of tools that we get um, provided to us by Microsoft. These are the sort of the power platform build tools. So as part of this, we should be able to achieve everything that we can see on the slide on here. All of this can be built out very easily in Azure DevOps. Um, and we can see we can do a variety of things from exporting solutions through to unpacking them, you know, automating our unit tests, running things like the solution checker, passing those results, and then, you know, uh, you know, maybe creating new work items from it, a whole host of different things that we can do. So this is what we are sort of uh, promised. This is the sort of, um, you know, what we read about when it comes to um, ALM, DevOps and the Power Platform. The reality, though, I don't know, I don't know. And again, I'm interested to hear others' thoughts on this. The reality just feel a little bit different. You know, in practice, it does not quite up to there. And I think it's something that Microsoft themselves, um, you know, recognise it is, and you know, it is a very serious and very huge area of investment by Microsoft, um, you know, at the moment, you know, and we, we're seeing all the time new features, new capabilities coming out. What, what, what we can potentially infer from that is that, you know, maybe there's a recognition that things are just not quite up to scratch. You know, there's work that needs to be done to get us to a much better sort of um, state of play. What it also feels like as well is that, OK, all this stuff reads good. You know, we can read the documentation, it all sounds good. But then when we get out into the field, when we start to implement all of this, um, issues just crop up all the time. You know, and again, as I said earlier, this could be down to me just being a big, big dummy stupidity. And I'm interested to hear thoughts on this, you know, or it could just be a case that, um, you know, um, we're just not there yet. And again, there's additional work needed. And, you know, what that means is that, you know, instead what we have to look at doing instead is look at writing out custom authored solutions to achieve things that, you know, in, you know, when you think about it, well, hang on, this should be really easy to do. You know, so a good case of this is that when it comes to trying to deploy our flows cleanly, um, at the moment, you know, you need to look at writing some form of custom scripting to be able to sort of achieve that. 
you know, and a link on here to um, a particular blog post that the um, that the amazing Scott Duro published a while back, which again uh, helps us to um, you know mine the gap with a particular issue at the moment when it comes to connection references. Uh, but the main issue with this is that we're having to go in and write PowerShell script to be able to sort of achieve something that you feel you know this should just work out of the box type stuff. So this is what it feels like very much to me in practice at the moment when it comes to the automation and particularly ALM and DevOps and the Power Platform. You know, so why is this all important and why should this, um, you know, and when it comes to our logic apps and Cloudflow, why is this such an important consideration? Well, we want to be automating as much as possible. If we're working with these quite sort of large deployments where we're looking to, you know, work in an agile fashion, pushing out updates very frequently, if we're not automating, you know, a large part of this, then we're going to be seeing some real significant pressure points emerge over time. Um, the key thing from Microsoft standpoint as well is that over time we're moving away from this what we term maybe this environment centric approach more to a source control centric approach. So as I mentioned earlier, we need to be getting and working towards an approach that uh, that ensures that our environments from a dev test point of view are ultimately disposable and we can very quickly and easily restore or recreate a particular environment based on what we've got in source control. So therefore, over time, automation is going to become more important as we move to this different sort of mindset. You know, and having a good, healthy ALM process will, will ensure that we've got no barriers and no friction towards getting us into there. You know, uh, when it comes uh, additional as well, in addition as well, we want to have that certainty that a deployment will succeed. We want to know that when it hits production, that it's going to, it's not going to be you know, have a massive error or we're not going to get behavior that we don't expect each time. We've hopefully ironed that out, you know, um, you know, through our deployments to test and UAT and things like that. And the ultimate upside as well from that is that we can then avoid those situations. I think we've probably all been there at some point in our lives where we're, where we're, we're trying for the 16th time to get something into production, you know, at, at 11, 11 o'clock on a Friday evening, you know, and sacrificing our weekends and our evenings in the process. So, you know, ideally, if we've got this all right, if this is all working as we want it to, then, you know, we can um, you know, do more interesting things with our evenings, you know, by you know, you know, putting our feet up, maybe learn a bit more about the Power Platform, you know, just give our, uh, you know, give uh, our weekends and our sanity back to us in some shape or format. So let's start to break it down a little bit now, then look at, OK, when it comes to our cloud flows and logic apps, how do they compare? From an ALM standpoint, and can we sort of try and find what a you know what's good about them, what's maybe not so good, and the things that you know uh, that could cause us some anguish or some frustration? And then we'll do a demonstration at the back end just to show you some of this um, uh, you know uh, some of these concepts in a bit more detail. So cloud flows then first of all. So what, what can we say is good about them? Well, you know we've got some really healthy and, and nice support now for things like our environment variables. So when we go into any one of our cloud flows, uh, when we open up the dynamic pane on the right hand side, we can see that all environment variables uh, in the solution in our particular environment are available to us. So it becomes very quick and easy for us to add these and incorporate these within our flows for, for as and when uh, the need arises. As I mentioned earlier, the current environment connector is pretty invaluable. You know, so for working with flows that are you know solely focused on dataverse. It's actually really nice and easy to get these pushed out. Um, we know that you know when it goes into test, it's going to look at our test data verse, it's going to look at our production data verse. There's no additional config required as part of this. So that takes a bit of a load off there for us. And also as well, our cloud flows now sit very nicely alongside our solutions. You know, previously in the early days of our flows, um, similar to our Canvas apps, we may um, you know, have to you know export them out as a package and then import them in. As part of that, you know, we don't have that um, nice ALM going on. But now we can incorporate them as part of our solutions. Uh, we can extract them out. We can store them in source control, and it all works really nicely from a um, you know from that particular ALM standpoint. So these are some of the good things that we can probably say about our flows today. The bad things. Um, so the first one maybe depends on the type of uh, audience you are, but certainly if you are maybe a pro code or a fusion developer, uh, the fact that you've maybe not got any sort of uh, ID support, you know, support for things like Visual Studio or Visual Studio Code could be a little bit sort of frustrating. Uh, that's, there is nothing stopping you from maybe going in and making some changes to um, the underlying JSON when you extract out a solution. So when you export the solution out, when you expand it out, what you'll notice is that each of your flows will have a corresponding JSON document. 
you could edit that if you wanted to. I probably wouldn't advise against it. And in fact, I do believe it's probably an unsupported step. So again, just use that at your own peril. Our flows um, have, I guess, what we term our basic logging and monitoring capability. You know, so this covers things like, you know, only a 30 day retention on our previous runs. Um, you know, we can't look to integrate it alongside more enhanced sort of monitoring and logging solutions. Uh, so potentially if we're wanting to you know, manage our uh, flows, uh, you know, maybe from a more formal standpoint, we could hit some barriers there. Does at the moment as well, some components, some um, features which you could argue are pretty essential from an ALM standpoint are still in sort of preview. Um, you know, and preview features, as we're regularly told, you know, they're not something that are generally advised for production. You know, so things like, you know, so good things, things like, you know, support for settings, things like support for Azure Key Vault integration. You know, these are all really great things, but it's perhaps questionable whether or not we're actually safe to start using these until they're out into general availability, because there could be maybe things change or, or things are altered and things like that. OK, so now we move on to the ugly. Um, so the, 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 my main bugbear at the moment, um, uh, seeing pretty much every day the uh, connections and in particular user owned connections. So whenever you set up a new flow in an environment, you have to set up a connection. That's all fine. The problem is that that connection is typically owned by a individual user in the organization. Uh, it's not something that can be shared out with users. And if it's a case that we then try and import in a flow as a different user, so if we're working as part of a larger team, we've got multiple people doing our deployments, uh, there's a really good chance that our flows will then break following the, the following our import action because it's not able to find and locate the existing connection that's been set up. So the typical experience that I find is that, you know, whenever we, we're deploying out flows, for example, from a DevOps pipeline, uh, it's always a case that you have to go in after the fact and fix the flows manually to get them working. And we'll come back to why that's such a problem in a few moments. Um, with our flows, uh, Big Brother, or in this case, Microsoft is watching constantly. Um, so they do actually go in and take proactive action against flows that may be causing problems. Now, this is not necessarily a, a, a bad thing, perhaps, uh, but we do have to be aware that, you know, if, for example, our flow is constantly failing, if our flow, you know, um, if something goes on behind the scenes, then potentially Microsoft will take action to go in and disable that flow. Uh, we'll always get notified after the fact, but we also perhaps maybe don't have that same level of control over our particular integration uh, compared to um, uh, alternate options such as our logic apps. Uh, licensing is always a, a fun topic and for flows, things can start to get maybe a bit more sort of confusing over time uh, when maybe when you compare it to the logic apps, it's going to be a bit more harder to maybe explain, OK, how much do things cost? You know, what do we need to pay for each month? Things like that become a bit of a nightmare to sort of go through. And then we've got what we what we call this unmanaged layer hell. So if we go back to the earlier scenario where maybe, you know, we've imported in our flows, um, uh, they've been switched off or there's a problem with them because maybe there's a different user and connection. We go into that particular environment, we fix the flow. Guess what you've just done? You've just added an unmanaged layer onto your flow. When you then go in and then maybe make a change to that flow in the future, you then push out again a new managed version. Your new changes aren't going to surface because that unmanaged layer is, not, is taking precedent over any managed customizations that you've made. So that's fine. OK, let's go in. Let's remove the unmanaged layer. Oh, but then what's happened? Your flow has broken again because the user owned connection is different. So again, you fix it and you're back to square one. And you just got this constant sort of cycle. Each time you do a deployment, you're having to go in, fix the flow and, and then do this each time. It's not nice. The whole point of hopefully, you know, trying to adopt TLM and trying to automate it is that we want to avoid this situation where we're going in and doing these manual amends. You know, so this is a book, particular bugbear of mine. Again, I'm, I'm keen to hear in the chat if anyone has any ways in which you can sort of get around this thing, but it does seem to be a, a, a bit of an issue um, when it comes to um, you know using flows and using DevOps to automate our deployments. It's not a problem if maybe we are looking to deploy manually or if it's the same user each time who's doing the deployment. Um, you know, um, their things seem to work quite well. And indeed, for certain projects that I've been involved in, this is the standpoint that we've taken. We've had to set up, for example, a dedicated service account. That service account is then used for every solution deployment that we do for flows. And we always do that manually to avoid these type of issues from emerging. So yes, yeah, so not so some things there, which again, bugbears of mine, uh, which can uh, harm us a bit when it comes to ALM automation and our cloud flows. 
let's move on now and look at our uh, logic apps then so what can we say is good about these then um it's actually pretty easy to actually get started with our logic apps so if maybe we're using our cloud flows um we can very easily look to migrate those across into logic apps it's not going to be too difficult provided we're using supported setup connectors uh, as i mentioned earlier we've got support for more advanced capabilities so if we're doing things like xml validation and transformation we're wanting to use uh, liquid operations so that's a fun fact for you did you know that our uh, even uh, logic apps support liquid templating and you can do things here like conversions and stuff like that so it's not just a power apps portals feature um, as part of our logic apps, we can have full control over the underlying workflow definition of the code. Um, we've got access to more enhanced logging capabilities. So, so um, logic app runs will be stored for more than 30 days. We can hook up to Azure Monitor or Log Analytics and actually really understand what's going on with our uh, with our logic apps. We've also got support for these managed identities as well, and this really helps a lot when it comes to maybe looking to you know avoid situations where we're having to store credentials. So what we can do, for example, is that we can set up a managed identity for our logic app. That managed identity can then be given permissions across things like Azure SQL, Azure storage accounts, other different things as well. Um, all of this can actually really help us and stuff like that. Um, and that's not, not something that we've got as part of our cloud flows at the moment um, and can harm us on there. OK, I can see a few questions in the chat about connection references potentially helping with the user and connection issue. Um, yeah, so we use connection references quite a lot. Again, maybe I'm just doing something wrong or something really obviously sort of um, incorrect, but even with connection references involved, it's still we still have problems with these user own connections. It just doesn't seem to resolve it again. I, and maybe I'm just missing something obvious on there, uh, but it just just seemed to be a continual problem, particularly if you're in teams where you're wanting to uh, where you're wanting to um, have multiple people doing the deployments each time as well. OK, we've got a question here from Dev. So how, how does the SharePoint list connection get updated for different environment deployments using the pipeline deployment? Uh, if you were to do this from a, from a DevOps pipeline, you'd use something called a settings file uh, to try and get this updated or to try and select the correct connection each time. And we're going to return and look at that, um, what those are um, in a short while. So uh, we'll return to that shortly. OK, so the bad when it comes to logic apps then. So it's it's not a system developer tool, pure and simple. You know, so you're going to need to have some experience working with, you know, JSON documents. You're going to need to have a a, a good, if not uh, excellent appreciation um, when it comes to um, how um, Azure works from a templating standpoint. You need to know how to use and work with resource manager templates, particularly if you're wanting to do things like parameterization, you know, and and more advanced capabilities that way. Logic apps, as we mentioned already, don't have our data first current environment connector. So we have to give some thought and consideration to how we're going to parameterize and ensure that we're using the correct data first environment each time. Uh, you know, and typically what I find when it comes to our logic apps is that you do need to spend quite a bit of time preparing the templates. Um, and there'll be a lot of parameterization and variables that we'll need to implement as part of that. I will see an example of this in a short while with us with a test logic app that I've got set up, what you need to do to get it working, how you need it to. OK, and then the ugly then. So um, some um, the common thing that you typically find with Azure is that there's all manner of different errors that can potentially flare up as part of any deployment or any any template deployment that we do. You know, so it can sometimes be a case of, OK, well, OK, we've missed a comma here uh, or we just need to update the API version. But sometimes the errors can be can lead you down some pretty, um, pretty sort of large rabbit holes and you end up spending the whole day just trying to resolve something. Um, um, something which should be again feel should just work. Um, so that's one of the difficulties that we find with this is that you you go off into all sorts of different sort of um, uh, different sort of rooms of Azure and finds out all sorts of interesting things in the process. Um, the only problem with that is that it takes you two days to fix the problem. And also the JSON templates as well. So that, you know for maybe just a single logic app we're pushing out. Okay, well maybe our particular template isn't going to look too bad. Uh, if, if it's maybe just a very simple logic app with a couple of action steps, then it should be fine. If our logic app is what we term, or what I like to term a spaghetti logic app, where it's doing literally, you know, hundreds and loads of different actions, lots of different conditions, scopes, and all sorts of stuff like that, 
then what you end up with is a really nice sort of, well, not nice, but a really huge document. There's thousands of lines of code that you're having to sort of go through and having to figure out what's going on. Uh, and if you're looking, if you're looking to group together all of the logic apps as part of a single template, then again, that problem is only going to get worse over time. So, you know, potentially quite difficult to actually understand and sort of work with those um, over time when you think, about, you know, with email JSON templates. Uh, so David's got a great question here. So how would you compare them from a failure recovery uh, or if problems are encountered in terms of the functionality of them? Um, so I suppose um, because you've got the, um, our flows can be stored in solutions because our logic apps can be stored in templates from a disaster recovery standpoint, then they are in theory, you know, should be able to be restored very quickly. Um, when it, I would probably say that if you're going down the manual route with our flows, then again, you can probably restore very quickly. And because our sort of both our cloud flows and our logic apps are effectively sort of stateless, it should be fairly quick and easy to restore them in both sorts of scenarios. So I probably would say they're on a par perhaps uh, when it comes to that. Okay, got a question here from Julian. Uh, which product, product should we consider if we want to perform a bulk update into batches for a large data set of around 100K records on the contacts entity in Dataverse? Um, uh, in Power Automate, we will be highly likely to hit the service protection API limit and some of the updates will be failed. Well, regardless of what, you know, any tool that we're using is going to be going through the uh, web API. So if we're using Power Automate or Logic Apps, we're going to be having that same issue occur each time. So it's, you know, when you couldn't really sort of recommend one product over, over the other there in that particular regard, you know, that is a dataverse limitation that you would want to, um, that you would need to circumnavigate around. What you would need to potentially look at doing in either tool is consider perhaps, you know, having some throttling built into your particular tool. So when you know that you're potentially going to be falling foul of some kind of, um, um, you know, a service protection limit, uh, making sure that you capture the appropriate error code that Microsoft returned to you and then waiting for the appropriate amount of time to then recontinue the operation. So really, it doesn't matter which product you use as part of that. It really just boils down to how you sort of um, configure and write your flow. So if you check the documentation, you'll see you'll see that the um, the exact status code, the exact um, properties that Microsoft return if you breach the service protection limit. And as part of that, you can then check the I forget the property name, but it's a value that then tells you okay how long you need to wait before you can then make a request again. Then you just wait in the flow and then resume from there. Um, in terms of the functionality from a, from a sort of DR standpoint, um, i.e. one of the steps keeps failing for all occurrences on runs, for example, a broken dependency, what can you do? Uh, like rerunning once the dependency is back up and running. Um, well, certainly with your logic apps, you've got that you've got a slightly longer history as we talked about um so you know if you've got a um you need to maybe rerun something for more than 30 days then perhaps you've got more uh, logic app will be better because you can restore that a bit sort of uh, sort of longer uh, both our cloud flows and our logic apps support the ability to rerun any previous action fairly straightforwardly and the experience there is broadly similar so i'd probably say they're on a par if you need, if for example maybe overnight you've had five failures regardless of which tool you're using, you should be able to go in and very easily rerun those five failures, um, you, know, you know, once you fix maybe the underlying issue in your API or endpoint or something like that. OK, let's jump into a demo then and just look at some of this in a bit more detail then. So we're going to jump across into the, the Maker portal. So I've got my environment set up over here and what I've got is a solution that I've put together. Um, using a Power Automate flow, and it's nothing really to sort of uh, shout or write home about. What we've got in here is just a single flow, my uh, appropriately named demo flow. This flow um, has a couple of connection references linked to it, uh, one for Azure Blob Storage and one for Dataverse, uh, and then a couple of environment variables that are then used to power the flow. And all the flow is doing is just uh, whenever a new account row is added into Dataverse, it's going to go off into my um, Azure storage account and and basically just create a new JSON document in there. So a fairly straightforward flow. What we're able to do as part of the flow, which is quite nice, is as we mentioned, we can bring in our different environment variable values very easily. So I can just select, select anywhere on the inputs down here and we can see there are the three different environment variables in my solution. 
And in this case, we've got access to broadly the same set of actions. Um, the only difference here is that we can use the current environment connector uh, to um, deploy out uh, to sort of um, run our flow. Whereas if, if it was our logic app, we would instead need to look at using uh, the, the legacy Dataverse connector instead. So if we're wanting to look at maybe doing some automation around this, look to maybe um, run this via DevOps, the first thing we need to do is actually get this into source control. Um, so I'm going to open up my uh, Visual Studio Code window over here. What I've got at the top up here is an existing um, project that I've got set up and a folder where, where I store my flow solution. Using the pack CLI commands, I can very quickly and easily extract out or export my solution from my environment. So on the terminal down here, I can just run the following command down here, pack solution export uh, to download my flow solution. So hit the return button. It's going to connect up to my environment, export out that solution for me in, uh, in managed. And then from here, we can then proceed to the next step, which will be to expand out the underlying contents. So that's all been completed. Um, rather conveniently, as part of the pack CLI, I can also do a, an unpack of the solution and then uh, have all the content stored down here. So I'm just going to do that now. Um, oh, there's a slight mistake there in the command. This needs to be true instead. So let me just fix that. OK, so it's completely unpacked the solution into this folder over here. There's been no changes made uh, at all, so it's um, nothing new to show on there. What we notice is that, as we mentioned earlier, our cloud flows are exported out into sort of a JSON document. We can maybe just format that quickly and have a quick look at how it all sort of looks. Um, so again, this is um, broadly resembles what we would see uh, when it comes to a logic app template, although there are some important differences, as we'll note in a few moments. Uh, we can see as well we've got our various different environment variables and other components as well, which are saved down. So as a next step now, if I'm wanting to look look at uh, do some automation through uh, via um, sort of Azure DevOps, I will need to look at generating a settings file for my solution. And this settings files defines the various uh, values that we want to populate for not only our environment variables, but also for our connections as well. So again, I can use the pack CLI to generate my uh, my settings file for me. So it's pack solution create settings down here. Hit return. After a few moments, we can see that it's now updated the document down here. And what we've got on here is basically just all of the different environment vari uh, variables where we can specify a value for each of those. And then each of the connection references where we can again specify the values that we want uh, to populate for our deployment. So let's um, look to proceed to the next step. Let's look to actually uh, deploy this out into a different environment. So the first thing we would need to do is actually go across into Azure DevOps. Uh, we can see down here that we've got a the settings file saved within our DevOps repo. We've got some current values defined for each of my each of the different um, environment variables that we're working with. And then down here for our connection references, what we need to supply in order for it to know which connection to use is the connection ID um, that we've got already set up within our environment that we're importing into. So to obtain this, what we need to do is go into the environment that we're going to be importing into. So this Joe Griffin environment up here is where we're going to import. Uh, I just need to navigate onto the appropriate connection. So Azure Blob Storage, first of all. We can see at the top in the browser the ID number that we need. So we can just copy and paste that like so. Let's edit this document, paste in the connection ID like so, and then do the same again for our Dataverse connector or connection, I should say. So again, just grab that from the URL like so, paste that into there, commit that. And then what we can do, we've got a, a pipeline that we've got set up over here that can generate us a release artifact. Let's just run that now uh, and give it a few moments just to complete. Whilst we're waiting, we're going to return to Visual Studio Code and we're going to look at the a, a similar kind of flow that we've got set up over here or similar sort of logic app setup that we've got um, that does the exact same thing that we saw with our uh, with the flow a few moments ago. And what we're going to do is we're just going to deploy this out and just talk about some of the things that we've been able to do here to ensure that everything works very nicely. 
Um, so to deploy this out, what we need to do is make sure that we've connected up to Microsoft Azure. So we're going to do connect easy account like so. I uh, just need to generate the token like so, minimize that. It's going to find me my subscription after a few moments. OK, and then now I can run a command down here to deploy this out uh, into an existing resource group using the template file and a parameter file that I've got defined on here. So whilst that's running, uh, all this template file contains up here is just a single logic app, which has broadly the same structure as the flow that we saw before with some important differences. And then as part of this template, we've got a few different sort of connections defined. And what we're able to do as part of this logic app, uh, as a po uh, in comparison to our um, uh, to our Cloudflow, is that we're able to use a um, a uh, uh, a client secret to be able to authenticate into Dataverse, and then also a managed identity for the storage account that we want to connect up to. What we're also able to do, which is quite nice, is actually also grant the logic app the appropriate permissions to access the storage account as part of the same deployment so we can then ensure that everything works very nicely at the back end. So that deployment is finished so if I navigate out into Azure give this a quick refresh like so we should see we've got a new logic app over here. Uh, this logic app is effectively good to go it's got everything it needs to start executing for the first time. Uh, the only main difference we can see on here is we've got a slightly different connector up here we've got a legacy connector that we're using instead of the current environment one otherwise the steps are broadly the same. We're able to use parameters in a very similar way and we can define those in our template file and we can also then go off and create our new a, a blob storage, uh, uh, um, our blob um, item, our new JSON file very easily as well. So we'll give this logic app a test in a moment and just uh, see how it all works very nicely straight away after the deployment. But what we now need to do because we've got the pipeline finished executing up here, uh, we can now create a brand new release at the top up here. So we're going to deploy out the flow into a new environment. So let's just check and make sure we got the correct date on that one. Hit the create button and then that should take a few moments just to deploy out into our new environment and we'll go in and observe how it looks in a few moments. We'll return now to our logic app over here. Let's give this a quick sort of test. Uh, let's go into um, go into our Dataverse environments linked to this. Uh, all we've got in here is a very simple Canvas app that allows us to create a new account record. Let's give that a moment just to load up and hoping and praying as always to the demo gods that they're going to be kind on me. OK, so we're just going to go in and create a new account. Um, so let's just call this maybe uh, Toso Limited. A uh, nice new account for Contoso. Some numbers over here, ABC, one, two, three, four. Save that like so. So a new account has been created. If we now go across to our logic app, we should hopefully be able to see a new execution after a few moments. Might be that we just need to run the trigger manually. Let's just do that. Yep, so there we go. So you can see it's been able to go off and run that successfully. It's all fully authenticated to not only our Dataverse environment, but also to our blob storage location. And if I was to go into the blob, um, uh, the blob location in question, we should be able to see a brand new file in here, uh, which will be called um, after the name of the account. So in this case, Contoso Limited. So if I navigate through now, go into the blob storage, uh, we can see that we should have a uh, Contoso Limited save there. So with the logic app, what we've been able to achieve is um, we've been able to parameterize everything really nicely. It's all been able to work straight away. We've not really had to take any manual steps to get this activated and working. We're able to use parameters throughout this to be able to change how our particular sort of uh, uh, sort of logic app behaves based on values that we specify at runtime. Uh, and certainly, you know, no manual interference has been required in order to get this all working as how we want it to. In comparison to our uh, flows, uh, so we can see in DevOps, this has now been completed successfully. So the thing that we've been able to do as part of this, just going back to uh, what we spoke about earlier with our um, settings file. Oops, no, let me just 
edit the pipeline instead. So the same settings file we've used earlier, what we've been able to do is we've been able to tick this option as part of our deployment over here, and then we'll be able to link up the settings file. And then what that should then do during the deployment, it will then use the current values that we specify, and it should link up our connection references to our connections. So let's go in and inspect this solution within our uh, this environment over here, which is where we deployed it out into. So you can see there's the new flow solution like so. So you can see it's been able to import in the environment variables just fine. We can see there's the values as we saw on DevOps earlier. But the main problem we've got here is we can see is that the flow at the moment is currently switched off. Um, so if we were to navigate into it like so, we can try to maybe switch it on, but I think we will have a potential problem with it. Let's just see. OK, so it could be that we've got a potentially invalid environment variable on there, so that might explain why it's not switched on perhaps. But uh, what we've been able to do in this case is to be able to link up to the connection references OK. Um, but the reason why it's been able to sort of do that is because we've had to go into the environment first of all and actually create the connections first of all. We've not been able to automate that particular step. So what we would need to do before any particular deployment is go into connections over here we'd have to select the new connection button at the top like so, and then create all of this from scratch. So potentially, depending on how many flows we're deploying out, depending on how many connections we need to make, it could be that maybe this is potentially quite an onerous thing that we have to do each time. And again, potentially for situations where um, uh, if uh, we've got maybe different users deploying, again, we could see potential problems emerge there. OK, then, so that wraps it up pretty much for the demonstration then. So hopefully you'll be able to see there how we can look to automate both a Cloudflow and a Logic App deployment and be able to observe the different things that we need to potentially consider and, and work with as part, of, um, as part of each one. So I'm just going to return to the slides uh, very quickly. Uh, and then we'll have time just to maybe go through some questions. So these are my sort of high level thoughts then uh, based on, OK, which one should you actually use um, you know, which one is going to be best based on your particular needs? What I would say is that maybe the specific scenario that we're working towards um, you know, will impact very heavily in terms of what option is going to be best. If you're going to be in a situation where you do manual deployments and maybe it's a very small project, then maybe Cloudflows could perhaps serve you quite well. Uh, when it comes to maybe more complex projects where we need that really nice automation end to end, then a Logic App could be a, most, a more appropriate choice for us to look at. The ALM story with Power Platform, you know, there are potentially some rough edges at the moment, but it is something that's, that will improve over time. It is something that Microsoft are actively investing in. So things are only going to get better over time. You know, so, for example, the fact that, you know, eventually we're going to have full support for, you know, key vaults, you know, uh, and when that becomes generally available, be able to link to key vault secrets. That's a really, really huge and significant thing that we've got and we can start to leverage. Um, what I would say that, you know, um, there is perhaps always maybe a focus towards doing 100 percent automation uh, where possible, and we tend to get quite obsessed with that particular idea. What I would say is that maybe it's maybe more of a 95 or maybe a 99 percent goal. Uh, it's going to be impossible to fully automate all things. Um, we should always expect there's going to need to be maybe some manual intervention that we need to do. If we, if we can at least get 90, 95 percent of the way there as part of whatever solution we adopt, uh, then that will um, th then I would probably say we've done a good job there. And finally, you know, we should be and the reason why we're using the power platform in the first place is that is that we, you know, we've got these rich native capabilities available to us that we can leverage and we encourage as much as possible to use those. You know, so certainly when it comes from an ALM standpoint, we should be, for example, using things like the Power Platform build tools. We, should, we, we shouldn't be having to go off and write lots of custom code to do our deployments. Uh, use what we've got there and, you know, and hopefully we'll have a better time and hopefully we'll be able to get to our end destination a lot faster as well. OK, so that wraps it up then uh, for the session then. Um, so I hope you found um, uh, what we talked about useful um, and some of the uh, different thoughts and considerations that sort of came out of it. Um, I'm happy you've got about just under or just over maybe five minutes for questions maybe. 
Um, I'm just checking the chat now to see if we had any new questions in. OK, so we've got a question here from uh, Davy N. So how did you create the flow deployment file and what does it contain? OK, so if I just show you again very quickly on that one. So to create the flow deployment file, uh, I ran the following command uh, here. So pack solution create settings. And as part of that, I fed in uh, uh, um, two different sort of values. I fed in the uh, the uh, the foot, the path to the expanded solution folder down here. And then from there, it's going to go in and look at our solution.xml. And then I've also then specified the name of the settings file and where I want it to be saved. When I run that command, the end result will then be a file similar to what we can see down here. And this will contain all of our environment variables and then all of our connection references. The only key bit that's missing from each of these is the, the value and then the connection IDs as well. We need to supply those and give those, and then from there we'll, um, we can then look to leverage this as part of a, a deployment pipeline. So I hope that's answered your question just there. And yes, I'd, I'd agree with I'd agree with Phil as well that you know the ALM accelerator, you know that is a fairly new thing. Um, I think as we saw as part of the previous session, it's got a really really nice capabilities as part of that. Um, so we should try and use that where possible, and it can try and remove some of these headaches where possible. Okay, and an interesting comment from Nickel. So actually, I've, 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 I've uh, sounds like I've turned Nickel completely against Cloudflows, and I've affirmed his belief in Logic Apps. Okay, yeah, as I say, that I generally find with Logic Apps that you know you can go a bit further in terms of parameterizing. And they've got some nicer sort of bells and whistles. So, you know, the fact that we can use manage identities is really, really great. You know, it means that we're not having to, you know, mess around with credentials and things like that. Um, so there are definitely some um, some tempting things with Logic Apps um, that, you know, that, you know, that, uh, but, you know, the caveat with it is that, okay, if, we, if we've maybe not got people in the organization who are pro or fusion developers, it's going to be a lot more challenging for us to engage with that tool potentially. So it's it swings and roundabouts. It's like if anything, any any tool, there's pros and cons either way, I guess. All right, okay. So um, I can't see any more questions in the chat. So again, um, thank you for uh, attending the session today. I hope you found it very useful. Uh, feel free to connect with me after today. Uh, my LinkedIn and Twitter details on there. Always happy to chat about anything to do with Power Platform or Azure. And I guess I'll hand over back to David now, the next speaker. Thank you very much, Joe. Really excellent presentation. Uh, thanks for saying that. Um, bear with me two seconds while I just stop the recording and restart the new one. <laughs>